Welcome back. It's a giant yet invisible. The world's shipping industry, which transports 90% of the world's trade, a fact that few of us know. Merchant shipping is the lifeblood of the world economy. It's also the greenest transport method in terms of carbon emission per ton per mile. It emits about a thousand of aviation. And big minds backed by big money like British-based engine and automaker Rolls-Royce is working to develop unmanned cargo ships. The European Union is funding a $4.8 million study of unmanned vessels. We're joined now by journalist Rose George. She is the author of 90% of Everything and has recently been on TED Talk. Rose, welcome to The Heat. Thank you. Now, your book, 90% of Everything, it's about the shipping industry, or more importantly, about the people who work in the shipping industry. Uh, it covers a great deal of ground, and you've done something that uh, is very adventurous. You actually traveled on a cargo ship from England to Singapore. I want to get to that trip in a moment, but first, let me ask you, what sparked your initial interest in this particular industry and this subject? It was a pretty slow process. Um, it started about nine, uh, 10 years ago when I um, left a staff job and went freelance, and somebody suggested that I go across the Atlantic in a container ship. So that was a 10-day trip, and that was in 1999. And um, it was so fascinating and so unusual that I just thought when it came to writing another book, I thought that's what I wanted to go back to. And so you got on that ship, uh, the Merce Kendall, as it was called, uh, and undertook this trip, which took five weeks from England to Singapore, over 9,000 nautical miles. Uh, tell us about that experience on the ship. It was wonderful. It was unlike any other experience I've had. I mean, I had that 10-day experience on the Atlantic, but every ship voyage must be different. And th there's really nowhere like a container ship on the middle of the ocean, because on the one hand, you're with a crew that's actually surprisingly small for such a big ship. So this ship was three football fields long, but there were only 19 of us on board. Um, so you're living in very close quarters, very intimate environment, but at the same time you're in the midst of all this immensity in the ocean, which is, after all, the Earth's still wildest place to be. And even though ships are incredibly safe these days, um, we could still sink any minute. And so there's all that danger, all that immensity, all that nature, and yet you're on a, you're on a very, very metal, mechanized, industrial object. So it's, it's a real... Um, place of contrast being at sea on, on a working ship and um, I, I certainly didn't want to get off at the end of it. I, I disembarked very reluctantly and would happily have gone back the other way for another five weeks. All right, despite the fact that while you were on the ship uh, you had no internet, of course cell phones don't work on the high seas, alcohol is not permitted but that didn't bother you because you don't drink and uh, as the New York Times review put it... I do drink actually. Oh you do drink so the New York Times got it wrong. <laughs> I do, I just, not much. Uh, but I believe the food, what was the food like, was very grim, as the Times puts it. Well, it, 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 it was tricky because I'm a vegetarian and um, the cook uh, was a lovely, lovely young Filipina woman called Pinky. But she had to get to grips with European food in a very short cooking training course back in the Philippines. And she hadn't been primed for a vegetarian. And uh, in the Philippines, it's one of the cultures which doesn't quite understand vegetarianism because if you can afford meat, then you eat it. And I understood that. So for about three weeks, I did get a few um, lentil soups with a little bit of bacon in. And uh, but after about three weeks, we we understood each other, and she would make me special meals. Um, but I did eat rather a lot of chips. You know, when we think about it, almost everything that we find in our homes, uh, almost everything in our offices is moved by ship from one part of the world to the other, normally from China to the other parts of the world. Yet we know so little about the people who work on these ships. What was your experience of interacting with them and getting to know them over that five week period? It was fascinating and it was a privilege because um, as you say, most, although 90% of everything is transported by ships, um, I think most people will rarely encounter a working seafarer these days. Certainly in the UK, the US and the industrialized nations of the West, our seafaring population has reduced dramatically since the Second World War. So in Britain, for example, it's gone down from 100,000 people to just under 20,000. Um, and we don't see these people anymore because our ports now, because of security concerns, have been um, fenced off. Very difficult to wander into a working port these days. Um, as I said before, we, we travel by airliner now, so I think for most of us, the general public, 
the sea is not seen as a place of industry or work anymore and the people who work on it are not seen anymore. It's very difficult for them to find time to come ashore because of the pace of, in particular, containerization. They'll often be in port for only two hours at a time, so you're, you're not going to meet these people. And uh, insofar as the dangers of piracy uh, are concerned, did they ever undergo any kind of training for that? Does a ship have something like a panic room, a safety place where people can go or the sailors can go to if they are boarded by pirates? Well, this was in 2010, so although that was um, when piracy was really, really raging, there were about 500 seafarers being held hostage at that point, and the ship was taken hostage the day before on exactly the same route we were taking down through Suez and down through the Gulf of Aden. But the training wasn't as good as it is now, because um, now ships are much, much more aware, and they have something called best management practices, which includes learning how to navigate to um, counteract small skiffs, so zigzagging, things like that, um, and having panic rooms and having very well set up panic rooms. We didn't have a panic room as such. We did have a place where we would muster if there was a panic attack and we knew what the signals were for the par if there had been a pirate attack. So we knew um, where to go, but um, that particular place was not necessarily a perfect panic room. It didn't have, you couldn't steer the ship. We didn't, we would have had food and water, but probably not for um, endless amount of time, not for, not for several days. So it was, um, it, you know, it was an interesting time in, in counter piracy at that point. Things have changed now because most, many ships carry armed guards, but we, Maersk would not allow armed guards on its ships at that point. Uh, were you the only woman on board the ship in that trip that you took? No, Pinky was a woman, the cook. Oh, and how did you, uh, how did the both of you interact with the rest of the men on the ship? It was fine. I mean, they seemed to treat her like a sister, and they were very respectful to me. So when I first got on board, um, I, could, I, could, I, was, I was cautious. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know these men. I, I was going to be living very closely with them for five weeks. So um, I, I didn't wear skirts. <laughs> I always made sure to wear trousers. Um, I kept my cabin door locked whenever I was out, and then eventually as I got more comfortable, I kept it unlocked, and then I kept the door wide open like everybody else did. So I, um, I never had any problems, and I never felt insecure. You know, I want to ask you something else, and this is not directly connected to your trip and your experience on board the ship, but you've called shipping the greenest transportation in the world, but you also point out that the carbon em emissions from shipping is equivalent to the emissions that come out of Germany. Um, how do you explain that? Well, because there's so much shipping. There are, um, there are 50,000 uh, SOLAS registered vessels. That's um, ships that have signed up to the, a particular safety regulation. Um, but it's often said that there are about 100,000 working vessels on the sea. So that's, that's a lot of shipping. And when you add it up, it does come to, in terms of emissions, um, it does come to somewhere near Germany's. And the reason for that is that on the high seas, many ships burn something called bunker fuel, which is pretty horrible stuff. It's the dregs of the refinery. Um, and it's got a lot of emissions. Um, it's got particulates that you don't really want to be breathing in. Um, but it's cheap. It's the cheapest fuel available. So that's why shipping, al although it is per mile, um, it, it does work out as the most green of all um, mass transport, certainly about 11 times greener than trucking, about a thousand times greener than aviation, but nonetheless, it is not benign. You know, there is now another initiative that is being talked about, and that is the development of cargo ships, which are essentially sea drones. Uh, they will be able to sail across the ocean, across the seas, without a single sailor. They'll, in fact, be remotely controlled. What do you make of initiatives like that? Well, I guess they're interesting. I mean, it makes for nice images. Um, but I, I've talked to some working seafarers about it, and I've talked to people who know about these things, and th the mood is one of skepticism. Um, and although when you read about these drone ships, um, it, it said that they would cut down on crew operating costs, so I've seen a figure up to 44%, maybe. Um, but then again, that doesn't, maybe that doesn't take into account how much you'd have to invest in the technology. There are reservations about how safe they would be because although we do have uh, good technology, radar, for example, um, can be uh, limited if there's something called sea clutter. So if there are other signals, 
bouncing around from animals or weather. Um, you do still need human eyes at sea. And my, my captain was very firm about this. He, he said that, you know, often he would find his crew, his officers looking intently at the radar when really all they needed to do was look out of the window. And there's a reason that Merce Kendall had windscreen wipers on its bridge windows because they do need to see out to sea. Um, I think perhaps there will be drone ships one day I and mean, there certainly are already uh, unmanned um, sea craft, unmanned uh, vehicles already being used as patrol boats by Israel and by the US. So it's not impossible, but I don't think it will happen for a, a very long time. Rose George, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. We would love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and story ideas to theheat at cctv-america.com. Once again, that's theheat at cctv-america.com. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.